Hi, and welcome everyone. I'm Bethany Hale, the Chief Marketing Officer here at Cedar. Thank you for joining us for today's Cedar Talk featuring John Collison, President and Co-Founder of Stripe. So first, logistics. We have about 45 minutes scheduled for today's conversation. Our speakers can't see or hear the audience, but please feel free to use the chat function in the stage tab to post questions or comments. So like, if you use Stripe and you love it and you wanna tell everyone about it, you can post away, it's always great to see. But as always, we will plan to save time for a few audience questions at the end of the conversation. So, you know, any questions you have throughout the conversation, please add them in the chat and we will try to get to all of them. First, another um, a quick plug. Um, first, if you like today's Cedar talk and you want more, you can sign up for our mailing list on the events page of Cedar's website. We have several virtual and in real life events coming up this fall, so make sure you get those updates. Also, Cedar is hiring. Today we have a member of our recruiting team available to answer any questions you have about careers at Cedar. To get in touch, you can just hop over to the Expo tab and start a chat with our recruiter there. So now I'd like to introduce this afternoon's participants. Leading today's interview is Cedar's co-founder and CEO, Florian Otto. And we're so excited to hear from John Collison, the president and co-founder of Stripe. Stripe is a technology company that builds economic infrastructure for the internet. So I have to say, I went on the Stripe website today, and first of all, it's gorgeous. Um, it's also got a really clear value proposition, great messaging, and just such a robust product line. Everything from payments processing to financial services to business operations, um, it's no surprise that the company has grown so quickly over the last 10 years. Um, John and his brother Patrick started the company in 2010 while John was studying physics at Harvard. So, you know, he's smart. Um, their goal was to make accepting payments online simpler and more inclusive after learning in a very difficult way how, how it was firsthand. Today, Stripe powers millions of online businesses around the world. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your experience, John. Welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. John, Stripe and Cedar have been partnering for a few years now. What do you think we have done well together? Oh, man. I think what the two companies have in common, and I think the, the thing we've managed to make work well, is we're both working in industries that weren't, you know, the first to be updated and modernized when the internet came along and, you know, with, with, with technology. And so, you know, traditionally, a lot of finance, you know, picture banks, mainframe computers, everything like that. A lot of essentially resistance to change in a lot of pockets of finance. You look at healthcare and you look at various parts of the experience and like, wait a second, why has technology not improved this? Why are so many things, you know, why are we still trying to decipher doctors, chicken scratch handwriting is, you know, that really how things should be working in 2021. And so I think healthcare somewhat resistant to change in a lot of places or resistant to technological improvement, finance resistant to technological improvement. And now you take a space that is at the intersection of those two things it's like, oh man, we got our work cut out. But I think the fact that we are starting to together really modernize the healthcare payer experience, I think that, that is something that, I mean, it, it's a pretty hard task. And we're obviously extremely early and loads of stuff to do. But but I think that the, the fact that we're starting to knock that out is, is to me very motivating. Yeah, and it's very rewarding hearing the feedback from the patients, definitely. And I think they deserve it because in the end, the patients are consumers as well. Mm -hmm. So let's rewind right now, maybe a few decades. So you moved on to entrepreneurship. And I think you began as a teenager when you founded Shopper, if I pronounce that the right. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit more on how you got interested in technology and entrepreneurship at such an early age, which I think is absolutely fantastic with your brother. Um, and I think neither of you had internet access for quite some time as children in Ireland. Yeah. Um, so I started Stripe with Patrick, my brother, and we had started a previous company. This uh, You really did your research at this company, Shoppa, and uh, not very many people uh, had heard of that. But uh, that was a company we started when we were teenagers. But, uh, you know, so we grew up in absolutely the middle of nowhere in, in Ireland. Uh, and as you say, a, a pretty meaningful event that we can definitely remember was when our, uh, it was pretty exciting, you know, Patrick jokes that his first uh, BD deal was uh, uh, convincing our parents to get a satellite internet connection. But that was amazing, right? Because, you know, you go from the internet being a thing that you read books about at the library to actually being connected to this, you know, uh, uh, 
wider world out there uh, and your horizons really being uh, broadened. Uh, and so I think once you, you know, once you get a little taste of that, there's, uh, there's no going back. And so we're always into kind of math and science and stuff like that. We're always into tech, learning to, uh, to, to program. And so again, once you, once you get a little bit of a taste of that and get the, you know, programming is very addictive because you can manipulate the wider world. You can do stuff. Uh, and so I think we wanted to, uh, to maybe start uh, doing something more. Uh, start a company, uh, and uh, you know, our first company didn't really go anywhere, didn't uh, uh, become much, but it was very useful in giving us that direct experience that payments was so broken because you know we were trying to charge money for the product that we were building the first time around. You're like, oh my God, how is this so challenging? And so I think the big experience that we took away from the first company we did was that internet payments was still so unsolved, and that's how we ended up starting Stripe. Yeah, it's fascinating. Sometimes also some struggles or constraints really thrive. I think the the, the creativity in whatever you're doing, and that's definitely one example of that. So let's talk about you. You founding Stripe. Of course, Stripe is right now a massive company, and uh, everything is an overnight success. So in, I think for you right now, in 11 years, overnight success. In 2010, you co-founded it, um, basically coding. I think during your month in Buenos Aires. Uh, so what was this initial inspiration? We heard a bit about right now, okay, the problem that you saw, but this vision. Um, and you maybe can talk a little bit about the high level on where did this change from being a side project into a real business? Yeah, I think the, um, first of all, I think the challenge with starting any company is overcoming the blindness that we all have, where you just assume this is how the world works, right? And this is kind of how it's meant to work. And I presume there's something very similar with uh, with Cedar, actually. I'd, I'd be curious to get the kind of the full story. But I presume so many people just said, yep, that's healthcare. That's just the way it works. And actually being able to have a view that, no, not only this is how it should work, and, and being able to kind of visualize some kind of advanced uh, 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 is a, some more advanced vision and then being able to actually make that happen. Those are two separate things. But again, I think a lot of people just go around with this, again, blindness to, to, uh, to entrepreneurial opportunities because just that's how things work. And so uh, and that, that's the way things are. And so I think step one is overcoming that blindness that we all have. And there's actually tons of opportunities to improve things. You know, I sometimes talk about Slack. It's like anyone in 2010 You, like they would have told you that it's so hard to do group chat and all the options are terrible. And so in a way, you know, I think Slack was the most obvious opportunity in the world. Stripe was the most obvious opportunity in the world uh, uh, because anyone who had dealt with internet payments, they could, uh, they could see this. And so then, you know, the question is, how do you get it off the ground? We were in college at the time. As you say, we were in Buenos Aires for a month. We couldn't legally work in the United States. So we decided to go somewhere, might as well go somewhere warm and, you know, with, uh, you know, nice cafes that are open late that you can work out of, uh, take advantage of the free Wi-Fi. So that's where we got the first version of Stripe up and running. That's where we got our first paying customer. And I think that the most important thing at that early stage is to create some accountability mechanism and basically not allow yourself to fool yourself. Uh, I see a lot of early stage companies where there's always like, oh, we just have to do this one extra thing and then you know we'll be successful. Then we'll be off to the races. Uh, and it's like, oh, we're not going to launch because we just need this one more feature or we need, uh, but they're always pushing out the point of accountability and that's very dangerous. And with Stripe, it took us two years to launch. But we had our first paying customer after three months. I think that was really valuable because, again, you have a paying customer. Then that's accountability because, you know, you're looking at a revenue number and they're emailing you with like bug reports and complaints and everything like that. And you have to actually support them. But I think the fact that we and again, obviously, this is all like I'm retrofitting stuff uh, onto you know those early days that we totally were not self-aware about at the time. But I think creating that early accountability mechanism so that you are looking at a revenue number on the wall, you have targets for next month. I think that's super valuable. Yeah, and, and, and really knowing the impact that you create that. So um, you, you talked a bit right now about, okay, it's it, it's in general a pretty obvious thing, but tell us maybe right now for, for everybody, I mean, payments or digital payments happened before already, and they happened a lot. I mean, in the definitely tens of probably hundreds of millions of dollars. So what was the biggest failing of this digital payment space at the time? Yeah, so... If you, again, rewind, to, we're going back to ancient history here, if you know you rewind to that 2009, 2010 period where uh, Stripe was started, say if you were uh, uh, starting Cedar, you would probably have used you know, one of the big banks. You would have gone to a Bank of America or a Chase or someone like that and have gotten their merchant services. And that would have had all the downsides that you would expect where 
you know, these companies, they didn't really understand internet businesses where, uh, you know, the, the fact that you don't have assets or the fact that, you know, you're dealing tr entirely online might have been a bit intimidating to them. I remember seeing kind of one software company, you know, being asked, uh, like a SaaS company being asked, how much inventory do you hold? And it's like, oh, that, that's not really how the internet works. Uh, and uh, also, I think you see a huge amount of outsourcing of technology or, you know, uh, traditionally the banking sector not really taking technology that seriously and so as a result the developer experience wasn't uh, wasn't that good and so with stripe it was fortunate that we were software developers and so that was you know the only thing that um uh, uh that was the only thing that we knew is like you know the two fish passing each other it's like lovely water today it's like what the, what the hell is water you know that was the only world that we knew was kind of building at my software and APIs. And so obviously with Stripe, we were going to build a developer focused experience where we would start from the API. For a long time, we had you know, the, the code that you, know, you needed to start to get up and running with Stripe on the Stripe homepage. So we we're you know, showing off uh, just how it was to work with. And then we realized that a lot of people are actually looking to do something maybe slightly convoluted when it comes to payments. Like again, the Cedar case, you're looking to help providers manage payer payments and stuff like that. So it's not like you're not just like a standard e-commerce store. Again, you're trying to do this multi-party model. Well, it turns out if you look at it, Uber and Airbnb and Instacart and DoorDash and Etsy, they're like every internet business is kind of complex in some way where they're trying to do some chain multi-party thing. And so us, again, early on focusing on, we want to make the complex simple. We want to build this programmable developer toolkit for handling money movement around the world. Global is a big aspect of it. Again, we were just following the customer needs and then you know, we can get into the, the user first um, uh, product development methodology. But, uh, but, but I think we pretty quickly realized that all businesses are actually trying to do something pretty complex and usually that complexity falls onto them. But if you provide a better suite of developer APIs, maybe you can, uh, you can handle that complexity for them. Yeah, and you, you clearly hit the nerve with that. And uh, you mentioned in the beginning, you really just built the product and there was very little revenue, but of course you had at least revenue, but you learned a lot. And then at some point, yeah, this flywheel, I think really started turning and yeah. you built this company. Yeah, and, and, and Stripe never had a, you know, a big tech crunch moment or, you know, the way like companies used to launch at South by Southwest uh, 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 back when there was, you know, the in-person thing and that's where Foursquare blew up and Twitter blew up and, you know, the, the, the usage chart is like, uh, and then yeah. it, it just kind of takes off. A point. Stripe never had that. It was just like, you know, uh, when we when we launched, we had 50 users or something completely tiny like that. But it just, you know, every month you add some more users, you add some more revenue. And, you know, after 11 years, it, it starts to add up. But it was kind of interesting where it was, it was quite a slow cooked process. Yeah, but it's, of course, very sustainable. And uh, this Cedar's business model as well. So it takes very long. But when it comes, also the clients stay very long. Mm -hmm. So one of the fascinating things, I read that you're a pilot. And also, mm -hmm. I think you flew your plane across the Atlantic once on your own, which is definitely one of my dreams at some point to do as well. But what did you learn from piloting airplanes that you, you might be able to apply also on either, for example, people leadership or running company? Um, yeah, so I've been flying for, I don't know, 11, 12 years uh, at this stage. And that was definitely that was definitely a highlight flying like a really. And this is not a, you know, a, a big aircraft. This is like a little flappy birds contraption, like four seats, uh, you know, piston aircraft uh, uh, flying it across the Atlantic. It was uh, uh, super. We we're kind of looking nervously as, you know, how cold is the North Atlantic uh, uh, down below? Uh, that was really fun. I, I think that, um, it, it has been a useful source of kind of mental models in thinking about the business. One is just the power of uh, of iteration and kind of root cause analysis, basically, when uh, you're really trying to el eliminate defects. And so, uh, uh, you know, people rightly point out that air travel these days is just absurdly safe. Like, it has no right to be as safe as it is. The fact that, like, when you actually just stop and think about it for a second, the fact that taking an airline flight is considerably safer than driving on a per hour basis, never mind a per mile basis, where it's, you know, order of magnitude uh, orders of magnitude safer. Like one is a much more risky, like when you're just like moving around the ground, you have nowhere to fall, uh, you know, whereas the other is, you know, you're in the sky contending with weather and there's a very complex mechanical beast and things like that. It didn't just happen that way. You know, in the 1920s and the 1930s, aircraft were, you know, air travel was ridiculously unsafe. They were falling out of the sky all the time and people crashing and things like that. But there's been this constant iterative loop of looking at the source of, uh, uh, you know, looking at the source of accidents, doing a root cause analysis, 
taking some corrective action based on that at an industry-wide level. Uh, and uh, that is how air travel has gotten you know, as safe as it is today. So there's a while where everyone was crashing into mountains, uh, and then they mandated that all airliners have this uh, EGPWS, emergency ground proximity warning system uh, and uh, you know that 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 you know severely uh, you know reduced the rate at which people were flying into mountains and, and you know you just keep iteratively doing these improvements and i think you actually don't want to apply that phenomenon to everything because it does come at some cost you know aircraft are more expensive to um certify these days and you get weird edge cases like the Boeing 737 Max and, and things like that. But when it comes to things like, uh, you know, systems reliability or something like that, I, I think taking that iterative root cause analysis to be constantly uh, eliminating defects can be very valuable. Yeah, I lo lo love that analogy. And it's definitely, I think this this iteration is probably what you have in business for sure as well. And it's, uh, yeah, acknowledging also that the human is failable. And uh, the checklist sometimes makes sense, right? <laughs> exactly. And, and when we look at, um, you know, say with Stripe, uh, you know, one of the big things that we sell on is the reliability of our systems. That, uh, you know, if you've used other payment companies, you actually probably know that payment companies go down a surprising amount. And it's like, wait a second, you have one job. I just need you to be available when, you know, I, I, I'm trying to, like, if you're down, I can't accept any revenue. And so, again, that's uh, an area where we bring this sort of zero defect constant root cause analysis mindset where you're looking to construct the accident chain and, and you know by definition if something can uh, you know cause an accident it needs to be you need to add some independence to the chain whether it be like you need to um uh, uh you know make it so that human error cannot you know take things down or whatever i mean i guess topical this week with uh, with facebook and whatsapp but again i think that's you know a particularly good example where you know that that is something that our customers are correctly maniacal about just the reliability of the of the overall systems uh, and it's a place where you, you can bring a similar approach interesting what are your predictions for the next big area of innovation in fintechs? The next big area of innovation in fintech? Oh, man, th th there's a few. So I think um, I'm really excited by how much uh, innovation is happening in consumer financial services uh, in fintech. And so things like TransferWise, they just went public in, uh, in London, but they kind of decided that foreign exchange is too expensive and a spe specialty foreign exchange business that just uh, uh, concentrated on that and provided it over the internet should be able to provide uh, you know currency conversion at a much cheaper rate than people are usually getting it from banks. And they just kind of bought off that little uh, uh, segment uh, and went and did it. And that has proved wildly successful. And now they've kind of significantly lowered the cost of converting money for, for people around the world. And so I think you're going to see lots more people biting off a specific area uh, and going and making that much better. We are uh, massively interested in... Uh, I, I would say industry. I mean, basically what you guys are doing across all industries, which is industry specific financial services, getting much better and getting tied in with the software that people use and their CRM systems and things like that. But we see, you know, what you guys are doing in healthcare, we see for, you know, p software providers for gyms or, uh, you know, restaurants or, or, or things like that, where you're getting specialty financial services that are much better. And then you kind of have to uh, mention crypto. I mean, it's, it's not... Uh, you know, people are not using crypto on kind of a day-to-day -day basis yet, but it's an amazing subculture, really interesting, you know, huge amount of kind of young talent going into crypto and actually like some pretty interesting ideas there that we are at a minimum kind of following quite closely. Uh, and so I think that is certainly an area for excitement. Yeah, for, for, for sure. And we, we were shocked when we started the company and how, ma how many of these transactions between the consumer and the healthcare system, we are talking about 150 billion growing at five to 10% year over year literally only from consumer to healthcare systems are being paid in checks, in cash, or literally only at the POS. So it was absolutely shocking to, to, yeah, to, yeah. to see those numbers, right? And that, is in, that, that was in 2016 in the US, right? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on where American healthcare finance technology is going? Oh, uh, I mean, that's one where I, I, I cannot turn up at an event like this talking to you and possibly <laughs> a time on where uh, American healthcare finance technology is going, uh, except that maybe I think these things can often move slowly and then quickly. 
uh, and then uh, like I'll take a totally different example, you know, the, the rise of the neobanks. Uh, yeah. Where you have, you know, in the United States, companies like Chime, uh, who are, uh, you know, providing kind of banking-like services, uh, or, uh, you know, internationally, New Bank now is, uh, I mean, it's basically as big as all the other banks combined in Brazil in terms of kind of new customer acquisition. And then in Europe, you have companies like uh, Revolut and Monzo and, uh, and things like this. I think if you were to rewind 10 years ago, people have thought, thought this is not possible. It's like, sorry, banking is different. You know, you don't get to just like build cool new tech powered experiences. And like the internet is here, but like all the existing banks are going to be kind of happy in their uh, uh, position. And then very quickly, a ton of innovation happens, uh, you know, more or less overnight. And so again, I think these things can happen like slowly and then quickly and areas that people thought were recalcitrant to change, they are for a while and then they eventually tip. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's definitely coming, and other industries have shown that as well, mm -hmm. right? And I think yeah. there there's it's a lot of ecosystem, and one system on top of each other. One is the enabler, and then it creates. Yeah, I think this this fly. So would love to hear a bit more, kind of on on how you do from a technical standpoint. So you are scaling very very fast, but how do you continue also to build fast as you grow and everything becomes more complex? Um. First off, I think you have to have it as a um, first class uh, first class goal for the company and people at the company. Uh, we have a set of operating uh, uh, principles uh, at the company, and one of them is just working fast, like getting things done quickly, is a uh, again a, a first class goal that we have. But I think that can surprisingly get you know forgotten, or there isn't enough cultural emphasis on it, or things like that. I think it's important to be fast for multiple reasons. One, it's like a I think a biomarker of healthy healthy systems, uh, where if it is not possible to develop software quickly, uh, then the software probably also isn't that good because it's like, well, you know, uh, uh, we don't have a good test suite. And so therefore, you know, it takes a while to know that a test is safe. It's like, well, that sounds like pretty creaky, rickety software, as opposed to if you have a whiz bang, super easy to run, you know, conditional test suite uh, uh, where, you know, uh, it just automatically happens uh, when you uh, ship your code then uh, that's also going to be a much more reliable software stack in addition to being fast. So I think fast is actually a uh, biomarker for other good traits uh, uh, because, you know, fast software is good software uh, or fast software development is good software development. That's one. The second is just from a, a, a talent and team point of view. Um, no one wants to work at a big, large company where, you know, you're spending all your time going chasing down documentation for this or not being able to understand that system or in like a freaking review meeting that, you know, you're getting alignment for blah, blah, blah. And so I, I think just working as part of a fast environment is, is much more enjoyable for the people actually doing the work. And so that's another reason that you want it. So then you're like, OK, how do you do it? I don't think there's any um, magic bullet. I think Amazon has, you know, talked a lot publicly about this and, and they do a pretty good job of it. I think it's about decoupling and so making it so that, you know, you are not on a thousand person effort. You're on like a five person effort that is somewhat independent uh, of that. I think to make that happen, the company has to be okay with some amount of inconsistency where uh, I think large companies are kind of consistency machines where they want to, you know, the Borg wants to come along and say, oh, well, we're going to put that through design review and legal review and you know, uh, review, 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 uh, and all these kind of different things. And you just have to be okay with some amount of, uh, you know, startup culture sounds nice, but startup culture means like moving fast and it might be somewhat inconsistent with the rest of what the company is doing. I think you just have to be some somewhat okay with that. And then you really have to invest in it. And so we have a developer productivity team and their, their whole job is making the development experience at Stripe fast. They're like a whole bunch of people whose full-time job it is to uh, make it faster to be a software engineer uh, at Stripe. And so they start off by, you know, you can't make, you can't, um, make what you can't measure. Uh, and so uh, they start off by measuring everything. And so we just measure how long software engineers at Stripe spend waiting on what? On anything. You know, how long do they spend waiting on bills? How long do they spend waiting on tests? How long do they spend waiting on, you know, a uh, uh, pull request to be reviewed? Uh, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then we go and we kind of burn down all the areas. Uh, is, I mean, it's just like profiling a technical system. They go uh, burn down all those areas. And so I think it's not rocket science. I think you basically just have to really care about being fast and then put in the, you know, put in the reps. Yeah, it's, uh, it makes, of course, all sense in the world, but it's very difficult to, to make that. Oh, it's hard to actually do. And it's painful to do because like rather than putting, you know, these new engineers on a new product, we're going to put them instead on making the existing development experience faster. 
Totally. So at Cedar here, we, we need to integrate with a lot of these legacy healthcare systems. And some of them, as you can imagine, yeah, they're written in COBOL or MUMS or something. And we, so I imagine you have the same problem also there at Stripe because you're building on top of these old payment processing interfaces. How do you keep your teams there motivated uh, to build and maintain these integrations? I think, um, you know, the... Um, I think people get motivated by what we're doing and uh, helping grow the G GDP of the internet and helping more businesses get started, helping bring more people into the internet economy uh, where uh, five out of six new internet users are coming online in outside of the US and Western Europe, basically in Latin America and Southeast Asia and Africa and all these places. Like that is where the internet economy is actually growing. And uh, we are helping. It's pretty cool because, you know, before, if you were someone in India or, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the um, uh, emerging world, uh, it was pretty hard for you to meaningfully participate in the internet economy. And now you can. And that really motivates people. I think people do not get motivated to go build like PDF parsing for some records we get back from some bank because it turns out they don't have an API. They just like spit out PDFs. And so we have to like OCR the PDFs. Uh, and like, that is not motivating to people. And so I think you just have to connect those things. It's like, because genuinely, I mean, I do a whole bunch of stuff that I, I'm, it's not what I would choose to do that morning, but it, it's laddering up to the, uh, the, the larger mission. And so I think you just have to always try and connect people to what it is that we're doing. One thing that we, we do that works pretty well is we just try to spend a ton of time with users, try to get them in the building. During COVID, try to you know get them in the virtual building. And so we do a, a like our kind of version of all, I mean, we have a monthly all hands and then we do this Friday fireside thing, which is uh, uh, like we interview various people around the company. And it's just kind of an hour. Uh, it, it's much more informal than an all hands. It's you know uh, somewhat more of a podcast or something like that. But we bring in users of Stripe to talk about their business and talk about what we should do better and everything like that. And again, I think people find that super motivating because when you're down in the COBOL mines uh, and you're like, wait a second, why am I doing that? And then you kind of zoom out for a second to watch the Friday Fireside and, you know, a user tell you how, you know, they could not have gotten their business off the ground with Stripe and here's how it's made their life better and here's how it's made all their customers' lives better. You're like, oh yeah, now, now I realize why we're doing it. And so I think, yeah, no, no one jumps out of bed in the morning to work in the COBOL mines, but people actually do jump out of bed in the morning to work on the mission. Yeah, and to increase the efficiency because yeah. everybody hates literally, <laughs> I think, inefficiency and definitely engineers more than anybody else. Yes. So let's go to a bit more, um, uh, I think, timely topic, uh, COVID-19 impact. And I think you, uh, you've you told the um, Irish Times, uh, when was it, end of last year, that it's entirely plausible that you could set up Stripe in Dublin or Oregon or wherever now. Everything has changed and particularly so in light of the COVID crisis. Can you elaborate a bit more on how everything has changed in your view? Well, I just think that norms really have shifted around how everyone works. And, uh, I, you know, I'm not one of these remote maximalists. Like I've seen some companies like kind of Facebook and Shopify and people announce that they're kind of fully remote forever. We're, we're not there yet. Like we will definitely have offices in the future. But at the same time, we just like spent two years training everyone on how to work remotely. And by the way, a lot of people at Stripe, a lot of other companies have like moved to different places and stuff like that. And so I think the norms in terms of how companies work and what happens remotely and what happens in person have really shifted. And so as a result, yeah, I think you totally could say, for example, uh, and I spend a lot of my time in Ireland these days, by the way, I kind of go back and forth between California and Ireland. And so as a result, like that's the kind of thing that would have been much harder pre-COVID than now, uh, where it's it's much more tractable. Because again, I think the norms in terms of in-person versus remote have, have really shifted. I think people are much more trained up on how to work remotely. Uh, I think, you know, previously it was something that, you know, the, the remote folks were really into, but, um, but it took... Uh, but, you know, kind of most people uh, would not have been into it now. Just everyone knows how to work remotely and it's totally a non-issue. And so I think you're going to see a very different ways that companies work, where I think now it will be basically standard for companies to be remote friendly, whereas probably kind of more of an exception previously. I think you're going to see talent markets work very differently because now if you live in Madrid, Spain, you have... 10x the employment opportunities than you did previously, where previously you were probably looking for a job in Madrid, whereas now all manner, you know, you can go work for really your choice of company and work, you know, as part of the cloud. That's really going to have knock on effects on, on talent markets. And you're even seeing this like there's a lot of startups cropping up that do global payroll because, again, there are so many more companies building global teams from, you know, 10 employees onwards 
these days that it created a whole new segment of the marketing near the payroll space and stuff like that. So I think all that's super interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And also, if you flip the coin, first of all, of course, for the employee, they are, I don't know, way, way more offers right now. Where can they can work on? But also on the other side, for the companies, there are just a lot of broader markets where they can recruit from. So I think company culture and attractiveness of the business becomes more and more interesting. So that yeah. triggers kind of a question that I would love to ask you that Stripe right now has scaled to, I think, around 4,000 employees. So now we're 5,000 now, five and a half thousand maybe. Oh, wow. Five and a half thousand people. So basically 10 times uh, as large as Cedar and you're still growing very quickly. Um, so we want to learn from you because I think you have done it very well. Do you have any advice for us or maybe lessons learned from scaling from this early stage startup, specifically in the respect of culture, cohesion and operations? Yeah. Uh, okay. You, you, you have to excuse me because I feel like when you sometimes talk about these topics, it sounds like um cliche but these things are cliche for a reason they're cliches because they're true but they're maybe hard to and so you know you um uh, you hear this hiring advice on like hire a players and then like once you've actually felt it you're like oh man that was really true but it just sounds totally <laughs> generic to, to hear it and so i i think i have a, a bunch of thoughts that probably sound pretty generic but um People can tell if your operating principles or values actually matter uh, because they can tell whether you know decisions get made based on them. And so I think you can have whatever you want written on the posters in the office. People can tell if it actually matters because like, does the company use that to guide decisions? And so I think you want to always be reinforcing whatever values you have in, uh, I mean, in basic things like your performance process and stuff like that and how you choose who to promote and stuff like that, but in how you actually make key decisions for the company. And then you should explain that to people at the company but uh, I think that's uh, something that's that's really important. People can tell if you actually care about your values, um, uh, if you actually use them in in making decisions is one. Uh, I feel like companies don't spend enough um, time or focus on onboarding people. Like it's pretty wild when you think about it that you know to become a hairdresser you need like many years experience and training. Uh, whereas you know for a lot of roles at Silicon Valley companies you may or may not have a college degree that is related to it. And then you come in, you get your laptop and you maybe like you hear some documentation or whatever and then off you go. Uh, and it's like, wait a second, and it gets back to maybe the, the flying analogy. It's like, again, uh, one thing I like in kind of uh, uh, piloting is like the focus on hard skills and drilling certain hard skills is like, this is how you react to an engine failure until it's basically kind of muscle memory, second nature. Whereas, again, I think in a lot of uh, tech, we just kind of hope that people will pick it up by osmosis. And so we do a pretty intensive uh, uh, uh developer boot camp when people start as engineers uh, at Stripe. Uh, I think that's pretty, um, pretty valuable. Maybe the last one I'll say is I, I think people overestimate their ability to judge people based on a half hour conversation, uh, like the classic interview. And a lot of interviews are pretty unstructured and a lot of companies end up with interview panels where like, you know, I have an unstructured conversation with them and you have an unstructured conversation with them and Bob has an unstructured conversation with them and Jill does. And then, you know, we talk about our unstructured conversations like, oh, they seem very nice. And so uh, I think adding like a ton of structure to the interview process. And so we do a lot, of, you know, with engineering, uh, we actually have people code in front of us. And like, it's an open book test, you can Google the docs. And you know, we're interested in I mean, Google exists when you're a professional software engineer, too. And so like, we're interested in seeing how well you can use documentation, just like however you want to solve the problem. It's, it's a totally open book test. It's not like solve some algorithms thing on a whiteboard. It's just like, we're gonna give you a coding task. And we're just gonna watch you do it and see how you think for a BD role would probably give you actually like a take home exercise where you actually produce some materials for us. And again, I think you can tell a lot more by having someone do some take home homework than you can tell by having a chat and seeing if you get along with them. Yeah, one, 100%. I think that's, that this voodoo, voodoo hiring is one of the biggest problems. And also then afterwards being very unspecific with the feedback, thumbs up totally. or down or something is completely yeah. nice saying, right? Yeah. It's kind of plane flies or plane doesn't fly. Not really helpful yes. knowing what to improve. So maybe my last question, then I want to go a bit to the Q&A. We have uh, a bunch here from the audience. Is, is literally on this recruiting side. So we talked a bit about culture and retention of people. And I noticed that that you have, I think, around a thousand jobs open right now, just in Ireland alone. So we are also in the midst of this growing of the engineering team. Um, besides just the assessment, literally, of the of the best candidates, what is your advice or thoughts on attracting the best talent in the area? I think you've internalized that it's a really competitive market right now where uh, software engineers uh, have loads and loads of different options available to them. And, and that's um, that that's 
cool to see. It's a good time to be a software engineer and they can choose between kind of working at a more mid-sized company like a Cedar, you know, uh, joining a tiny startup, working at a Google or a Facebook or something like that. And so I think you have to realize that like a lot of like all of engineering is uh, sorry, all of interviewing is selling. And so, you know, we definitely put some work into the candidate experience because as people are interviewing, like it, it's not, you don't interview people. And then at the very end, they're like, okay, we want to make them an offer. And uh, now we're going to start selling them. They were making their mind up about you all along. And so the candidate experience, we would always uh, uh, put a lot of effort into that uh, all along. Uh, and uh, just how they have a good day on site, on site at Stripe. And you know the people we say no to, because you probably say no to 80% of the people who come to on sites. How do we make sure they still say, oh yeah, Stripe was awesome. I really like those guys. Uh, uh, you know, and they refer their friends to it. I'm not saying we <laughs> got to that with everyone, but uh, but that was definitely our goal in the process to have the people we say no to really rate the experience. But I think you have to realize you're kind of competing for talent out there. And so then it's like, how do you make it um, attractive to, to them? Interesting. So let's go to a question here from the audience, uh, from Heath Copper. Um, how are all the different currencies and their respective fluctuations with one another managed, traded, inventoried? Um, I don't know if Stripe does anything particularly special there. You know, part of the value that Stripe provides is that if you're an internet business, you're dealing with, you know, the global financial system. You're accepting money from uh, customers all over the world. Uh, and we just want that to make that, you know, fairly transparent to the user so they're not having to think about it. And so we have lots of complex systems for kind of managing and exchanging currencies uh, behind the scenes. But our goal with Stripe is to, again, make it a pretty simple API where it's like, I want to accept, you know, 20 British pounds from uh, my user over here. And I want to get Australian dollars in my bank account over here. And we just kind of make things happen. Um, but, but that's at least kind of from a product point of view, how we think about it. Interesting. Next question here comes from uh, Kinshuk um, uh, Mishra. How do you continue to keep the simplicity of the customer development focus from the early days that made Stripe successful relevant to a much larger and development methodologies for mature products versus early stage start, uh, products? So a mature product, you kind of understand why it works. And often the discussion with customers is about... Um, more functionality or, uh, you know, rounding it out or things like that. Uh, and so, you know, an example of that might be uh, Stripe Connect, our product for kind of platforms and marketplaces. Tons of platforms use it already today. And so they might say, OK, we want, you know, coverage in this country or we want, you uh, 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 you know, we want it to handle, uh, you know, 1099 taxes uh, better or something like that. And, and we'll go do that. And I think people can sometimes, you know, poo poo, the, you know, that kind of product development as checkbox exercises. But there is an element where just like these are very big product surfaces. And often it is about, you know, as customers, the reason they're coming to us is Stripe can do so much. We can handle the payments and the compliance and everything like that for you. And so you're like the breadth of the product is is what you're selling on. But, you know, you you understand what the product does and what the value prop is, and you're trying to make that value prop applicable to more customers. Uh, then with early stage products, you don't know what that product is, and you're essentially pre-product market fit. And so it's very dangerous to treat a pre-product market fit product like a post-product market fit product. And so I think one, you have to be clear on are we before or after product market fit? And you know, you can have an existing company whose main product has product market fit, but they're starting a new add-on or line of business or something that doesn't yet. And then you want it to be about keeping the product surface area small, you know, ease of uh, iteration. And so when we launched Stripe Capital, which is our lending business, so, you know, we started with this thesis that it's all this data flowing through Stripe. We can use the data in a business's account on Stripe to offer them a loan. That's like a hypothesis you can test. And so that team was very small. It was like sub five people when they launched. And they were just testing the hypothesis of, can we economically make loans to users that they find interesting uh, uh, and, uh, you know, will that be a, th a thing at all? So keep it really small, iterate really fast, test the core product hypothesis. Does anyone want this? And then when it works, then you can get into, oh, well, people want repeat loans and we should make it work internationally and things like that. But I think they're very different modes. And so I think you have to have a real clear delineation. I think a classic scaling company thing is you have a product that works, you start scaling it up, you develop all these ways of kind of scaling up a product, and then you decide to launch a new product. And you treat that new product like an existing scale product that already works. But those are totally different motions. And so I think companies have to create this deliberate labs approach for, you know, we're going to start a new product. And some new products don't work. You know, if it doesn't work, we're going to shut it down. Uh, and, and I think companies really have to get good at 
are we working in the existing product mode or the new product mode? And those are actually pretty different. Interesting, yeah. Another question comes here from Rene Rudzinski. Um, how do you create a balance uh, between fast development and avoiding burnout? What tools, products, approaches have worked best? I think ideally it's pretty orthogonal to burnout and honestly probably helps with burnout because again, uh, like when you are able to make forward progress on something, it's more satisfying. When you feel like you are putting in all these hours and not getting output, I think, you know, people tend to find that pretty dissatisfying or, you know, you put all the uh, time in and then project is killed at the, last, at the last minute or something like that. Again, just really dissatisfying and, and demotivating. And so for us, fast development is not about kind of the number of hours in as an input. Uh, though, I mean, sometimes you do need to, you know, work late or, uh, you know, you do have a sprint in the lead up to, uh, to launch and stuff like that. What it's really about is, uh, you know, what is the productivity of the time you're putting in? Uh, and so, again, a classic one is documentation. Uh, something that can really slow people down is they're not able to find stuff internally. Again, they start as a new person and they don't know how to spin up. And so you can just have people go and actually create good documentation so that every new person coming in, they understand how the system works. They understand that, where to go. That's not at all about, you know, whether pe are people burning out or not. It's just, are you kind of correctly signposting people and putting the investment in that pays off later? Interesting. Okay, the next question um, is directed uh, to both of us um, from Barack Kaufman. And the question is, um, how do you manage your schedule priorities and time? How is your time split on a weekly basis? Uh, I think all people inside, um, uh, you know, running companies, there's sort of the calendar battle where uh, it feels like everyone is fighting battles of the same nature with their calendar. And so what are those? It's uh, a few things. It's one, uh, being externally focused enough where I think le le left to your own devices, it's very easy for your account calendar to become inwardly focused where you're meeting with other people at the company and you're not spending enough time with uh, customers or people outside the company. Why is that important? It's important for a few reasons. One, it gives you energy where you actually go talk to customers like, wow, this is awesome. I can't believe we got to do this. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's so inspiring that we get to you know work with all these people. Uh, and then also it gives you a really valuable perspective where, you know, you're like, you can walk around inside the office being like, wow, this product is so great. And then you go talk to customers and they're like, this is not solving my problems at all. I'm really unhappy with it, whatever. And again, it's, it's like this reality check. And so I think one battle is making sure that you're spending enough time outside the walls of the building. Another battle is getting enough focus time, essentially, where, you know, the, the natural tendency will be to first, you know, you schedule things in hour blocks and then half hour blocks and there's a 15 minute slot here and things like that. And it's just like finely sliced and diced like an onion. Uh, and so I think uh, the goal is to be able to have actual long periods of time to focus or go, you know, uh, use the product yourself or go actually kind of write, uh, again, you know, documentation or memos or things like that. But I think getting enough focus time is another battle that uh, people probably fight. And then I, I think people tend to schedule their time way too far in advance and like some fire pops up and it's like, oh, yeah, let's get a meeting together with people in four weeks uh, and it just like slows down the cadence of the company. And so I think keeping enough flex time essentially. So I think there are all these battles that everyone in the world, who, you know, who works at a company of some size tends to be fighting. I don't know. What would you say? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So I think, I mean, there are different waves, right? On the, uh, on the, uh, on, on the calendars. And I basically think, especially in the early stage of the company, yeah, you literally have phases, I would say weeks or months where you do purely sales or where you purely just, trying to get investors or purely recruiting or purely process operations. So I think there are these macro, let's call it seasons or so. And then there, of course, on the macro, on, on the micro level, that means on the weekly cadence or so, where of course there are these internal, external facing is always a battle. I, I definitely agree with that. I think one of the most important things to also, I mean, to, to, avoid, uh, to avoid burnout, and I've seen that, and, and, and I was, I think, definitely earlier this year, definitely at my limit, so on the capacity. And one of the things I found out that a lot of either meetings or um, assignments that I got require preparation time, and I never put them on the calendar. So what happened, I needed to do that after work, very late or very early. I wasn't the most productive, and it caused so much stress. I think that's the one mistake I've, I've definitely made my own. And then I think um, a second mistake that I've done is a little bit guided towards your um, scheduling too far ahead of time. 
is that I got pulled into meetings where I actually am not the most effective right now really being there. I might be fine being in there. There's nothing wrong with me being there, but I think I can totally cancel them. So I started literally just canceling them, assign somebody who is responsible for making the decision and then pull out of there. And I think those those are kind of small hacks or so where, yeah, definitely trying to get better there. John, we are out of time. Thank you so much for doing this. This was extremely helpful, extremely inspiring, I think, for the entire team. The good thing is when you talk to John or his brother, you can make an hour Cedar talk in 45 minutes and get <laughs> at least the same content done. <laughs> I'm really glad we got to do this. I feel like we could have kept going for hours and we are delighted to be your partners. It's been so fun to, uh, to get to work with you all and, and we have so much good stuff planned. And so thank you. We are excited for the future. Thank you yeah. so much, John. Take care, Florian.